Please help me give a warm welcome to our next speaker, Dr. Jerry Tennant. He graduated from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School with a medical degree and is, a, is founder and director of the Tennant Institute for Integrative Medicine, a clinic specializing in the treatment of chronic pain patients with microcurrent technology. He's an international lecturer and has numerous publications on ophthalmic surgery and pain management. He's been training medical doctors and healthcare protectors practitioners in pain management since the year 2000 and was interviewed for a PBS documentary in, 19, in, 20, in the year 2013. Please welcome Dr. Jerry Tennant. Thank you. Okay, I guess this is working. Good morning. Well, it's always kind of interesting to me to see that we have an ophthalmologist talking to a group of dentists. Somehow that doesn't quite compute uh, in the beginning, but hopefully uh, over this uh, next little while we'll uh, see how those two do indeed fit together. I was fortunate to be asked to speak to this group in uh, Vancouver. Whoops, I'm falling apart here. Um, uh, not so long ago. Let's see how this thing works. Or doesn't. Um, okay, that goes over from here. You would think the size of my ears, this would never fall off, but uh, something about my nickname being having to do with Dumbo, but I don't know what they're talking about. Does that work? Okay, try it again. So uh, I wonder how many of you were in Vancouver where, and happened to uh, hear me speak. Um, uh, so let, could I see hands again so I'll know how many of you have heard this? Uh, okay, thank you. All right, so we have quite a few that haven't. So uh, let's... Um, uh, for those of you who have this, just for the fun of it. Shall I put another quarter in? Oh, I guess that works. Okay. So just for the fun of it, um, let me just give you a, um, a little uh, case history of something that I saw this week. Um, I can uh, get this to work. So with this in mind, you'll recall that I've discussed many times uh, the fact that in my career I've only seen seven uh, cancer cases where I could not find a, uh, a tooth in the same acupuncture meridian as the primary malignancy. And uh, with a small study that I did uh, in Phoenix with an oncologist, we found that 70% of people with a malignancy have uh, a root canal in the same meridian as their primary cancer and 30% have an infected crown. So with that as a background, a woman came in to see me this past week and she said in her paperwork that she had uh, tumors in her lungs uh, and um, so obviously uh, where would I think that she might have uh, a dental problem? Well, you can see here, uh, 4 and 5, 12 and 13, 18, 19, 30, 31. So, you know, with something near approaching a 98, 99% accuracy, she should have, if she's got a tumor in the lung, she should have problems in, in one of those uh, um, eight teeth. And when we looked in her mouth, of course, nothing was there. And so I'm kind of saying, wow. Today might be a stellar day. We have uh, an eighth patient where I don't have a dental connection to this malignancy. 
So that uh, was quite unusual. And so I started talking to her. And then one of the strange things that came out is that her, the cancer in her lungs was a carcinosarcoma. I'd never heard of a carcinosarcoma, have you? That's, uh, you know, carcinoma is one thing, sarcoma is another thing. Why? What's a sar uh, carcinosarcoma? Well, it turns out it's a very rare uh, malignancy of the uterus. And she had forgotten to put in her paperwork that she'd had cancer of the uterus five years ago. And it was, guess what, a carcinal sarcoma. And so now I said, ah, okay, makes sense because she had two root canals, one and two, number, tooth number two and one tooth number three. So now we've got uh, root canals in the pancreas stomach circuit. And uh, obviously what's going on in her lungs is uh, metastasis. Uh, because the uterus power supply is the spleen meridian. So the point I'm making, and uh, this will become more apparent as the hour goes by, the thing that I do whenever I see a patient and whatever symptom they have, uh, I say, okay, what is the power supply to the organ that has the symptom? because there is where the answer will be what caused it, because they'll almost always have low voltage in the power supply to whatever organ is malfunctioning. And since her uh, primary malfunction was in the uterus, not in the lungs, then it all made sense. Because if you look at the power supply here, uh, as I'll show you in a moment, uh, the power supply to every organ is a specific stack of muscles that we call acupuncture meridians, but it's actually uh, the power supply. And if we blow this up a little bit so you can see it better, you can see that the uh, pectineus muscle is the actual power supply to the uh, sexual function organs in both males and females, despite the fact that in acupuncture literature it says it's the bladder meridian, it's actually, in my experience, the uh, spleen meridian. So now it all made sense. She had two root canals in, uh, in two and three. That's what uh, is associated with her uterine cancer. And now it's metastasized to the lungs. Uh, so that's kind of where we're headed with this lecture, to show you the dental connection to systemic disease. Um, so let's begin here. and. I have this disclosure on my slide, but I'm supposed to read this one. I do have a financial interest of a product in my talk or with a company offering grant monies for this continuing dental and medical education program. Obviously, anything that has my name attached to it that's a product, I obviously have some interest in that. Well, one of the things that one must realize in order to understand the, uh, the uh, voltage connection to illness is the way the body's wired up. All of a, half of our organs in our bodies are, serve as capacitors and half of our organs serve as coils. And they're wired together uh, on a square like this which is called being wild, wired in parallel. And then it uh, has a battery down here that uh, uh, makes it go and then a circuit breaker. So in our, uh, the solid organs in our body serve as capacitors. The hollow organs serve as, as impedance or coils. We have muscles that serve as batteries, and the teeth are our circuit breakers. So once you begin to realize the importance of how the uh, tooth fits into every power supply, every circuit in the body, you begin to see that when the tooth is infected, it, it acts like a circuit breaker that goes off. And that's why you get power failure in that organ, and that's why it doesn't work. So that's where we're headed with uh, this lecture. Now, I want to give you one more case study to be thinking about uh, to help you realize how diverse symptoms can be with a simple single tooth dental cause. 54-year-old male begins to notice increasing fatigue and mental fog over two to three years with increasing inability to deal with stress, with insomnia, inability to remember uh, an entire phone number when dialing, and significant GERD. A visit to the internist revealed nothing. 
spectrocell blood test revealed low levels of vitamin B12, so the internist orders a B12 blood test, which confirms the low level, but also finds a platelet count of 43,000, with normal being 150 to 350,000. Hematology consult, consult results in a bone marrow test. This reveals active marrow with no malignancy. Was started on prednisone, 80 milligrams a day, with no effect on the platelet count. Prednisone caused severe weakness in the legs and increased GERD. Started on Prilosec. Progressed to overwhelming fatigue and confusion, including inability to find way home. Started on Effexor with no improvement in mental confusion. Developed idiopathic neuropathy in the left foot. There was periodic pain in the left upper abdomen and aching in the left maxillary sinus and x-rays are normal. Developed double vision, exam by three ophthalmologists, can't determine the cause. A worsening platelet count was accompanied by petechia of the feet and ankles. There was constipation, postural hypertension, can't stand loud noises, rowdy crowds, people arguing. EEG reveals evidence of encephalitis and told that nothing can be done. So, um, what I uh, want you to see from this case study is how widespread various symptoms can be and unless you understand the way the body is wired up uh, as an electronic device, you would never put all those symptoms together. So I'm going to explain how all of that works and then we'll come back and show you uh, the, uh, the single cause for all of those various uh, illnesses. So how did I get to be talking about this subject? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I'm trained as an ophthalmologist. I did uh, standard ophthalmology with a focus on cataract surgery between 1964 and 1995. I did the majority of the FDA study for the company called Visex uh, for their Exmer laser. I did 1,000 cases in the U.S. and 2,000 cases abroad from 1981 to 1995. What we didn't know is that the, vi the laser wouldn't kill viruses. It simply released them from corneal cells as we were removing corneal cells to reshape the, the cornea. And those viruses simply came up through the, uh, like a, a little mushroom cloud, came up, went through my mask, through my nose, into my brain, and so I developed encephalitis and a bleeding disorder. So the symptoms of that was that I could see a patient and know what was wrong with them, but I couldn't remember how to write a prescription. So I would have to go sit in my office for 10 or 15 minutes and finally get enough synapses working and I could remember how to write it and then go back to work. In addition, I developed spastic movements, so I would be sitting here or standing here and all of a sudden I would have that sort of thing, which doesn't work really well if you're operating inside somebody's eyeball. Uh, and so for all those reasons, I had to quit work at the end of November 1995, and here's how I spent most of my time. I slept 16 hours or so a day. I'd have two or three hours a day in which I could think uh, clearly enough to uh, understand a newspaper, and then like a light switch, it would go off and I couldn't understand it anymore. One of the things that's interesting about this picture is that I had uh, viruses in my brain and viruses in my spleen. And uh, this was Tigger, this was Pooh. Tigger would always come and lay on my head, uh, and Pooh would always come curl up next to my abdomen. So I consider these two the original electron donors or the original biomodulators. Um, after I got well, by the way, they quit doing that. It's interesting how uh, animals are able to sense what your problems are and try to help you with it. So I was told I would develop Burkett's lymphoma and that nothing could be done about the multiple viruses in my system. Um, and uh, my blood profile kept getting worse and worse and suggesting that the end for me might be the summer of 1999. Um, as uh, has been said, uh, the rumors of my death have been greatly exaggerated. Uh, this is kind of a chronological uh, uh, view of what happened. You can see here's how I looked at uh, Christmas time in 1999. Here's how I looked at Christmas time in 2005. And this was at Christmas time in 2013. So I turned 74 a couple of months ago and am doing better, obviously, than I did when this journey began. And um, although my kids continue to to profess the opposite, it seems to me that my brain's working again. So um, how did I uh, get through this journey? Well, 
It basically began by changing my paradigm. So I'm trained in the traditional medical paradigm, as all of you were. Uh, but as I began to try to figure out how to get myself well in those two or three hours a day that I could think, I got the idea that if I could figure out how to make one cell work, I could make them all work. And so I realized that although the cells in the body look quite different, they all have the same hardware. They just have different software and function differently. And so I began to read uh, cellular biology books. And the other thing I began to uh, find, figure out uh, as I read um, uh, was that the body is constantly replacing itself. That's a paradigm that I was, I guess, sort of aware of in the back of my mind in the cobweb somewhere, but had never really thought much about it. It turns out that the uh, retina, uh, in the retina of the eye, the macula gets, uh, cells get replaced every 48 hours, uh, which, by the way, is the reason I can reverse macular degeneration in less than a week. Uh, the lining of the gut is uh, replaced every three days. The skin you're sitting in this moment is only six weeks old. Your liver is eight weeks old, your nervous system is eight months old, etc. So we're constantly replacing ourselves. And because we're constantly replacing ourselves, we have to uh, be able to uh, have all of the necessary components to make new cells. And so a theory I would propose to you to replace the one you're currently using is as follows. Chronic disease only occurs when you lose the ability to make new cells that work. So let me say that one more time. I think it's uh, an important and powerful paradigm. Chronic disease only occurs when you lose the ability to make new cells that work. So that will lead us, of course, to the question of what does it take to make new cells. So um, the, um, the things you need to make new cells are basically as follows. Cells, as I'll show you, are designed to run at minus 25 millivolts, but it takes minus 50 millivolts to make new cells, and we're going to be discussing that more uh, in just a moment. Uh, the cytoplasm of cells are made primarily of amino acids. So what's the body's source of amino acids? When you eat a protein, the uh, stomach acid along with some pepsin is supposed to break the, amino, the uh, proteins into amino acids so you have those available to make new cells. I would mention, however, that the nerve cells are 50% uh, cholesterol by weight. And so they are uh, a bit special. So to make nerve cells and to keep your brain, uh, eye, ear, etc., working, you have to have a whole bunch of cholesterol. Um, the cell membranes are made of fats, very specific fats called phospholipids. But uh, for those to be available, you have to be able to absorb fats, which requires bile. The liver makes a quart and a half of bile a day, so it needs a storage tank, namely the gallbladder. So you have to have a liver and gallbladder that work. And by the way, the signal that tells the liver to make bile and the gallbladder to put some into the digestive process is controlled by our old friend stomach acid. When stomach acid hits the small intestine, it tells the pancreas to release a hormone called cholecystokinin, which then tells the liver and gallbladder to work. So again, we're back to having to have stomach acid. You have to have vitamins and minerals, and those are under control of a substance called fulvic, F-U-L-V-I-C. And so you have to have fulvic if you're going to have appropriate vitamins and minerals. You have to have water, and the water inside of cells is not H2O, it's H3O2, which is an electron donor form of water, which the body most easily uh, manufactures uh, in the presence of infrared light. And by the way, for those of you who have forgotten, the Earth is surrounded by infrared light uh, in the same quantities both day and night, but you have to get outdoors to be exposed to it, right? Um, so getting outside instead of uh, being always in uh, your home, your office, or your car is an important portion of getting the water correct inside your cells. You have to have oxygen, and as we'll discuss, oxygen is under control of uh, two different things. One is the voltage of the water, and the other is you have to have some oxygen in the neighborhood, 
and oxygen being in the neighborhood is under control of the arterial capillaries, which is under control of nitric oxide. Then you have to deal with toxins. If you make a new cell but you have uh, toxins hanging around that destroy cells as fast as you can make them, obviously you're going to have a problem and so you have to deal with detoxing in various methods including homeopathy. Sometimes the only thing that I find can, that is available to detox people are is making homeopathics of those toxins. And then you have to deal with cellular software. The DNA of every cell is designed so that it puts out specific frequency sets to tell the amino acids in the cell what they're supposed to do. And sometimes those get jumbled up in the, essentially the same way as when your computer gets a virus. And so when you hit an A, you get a Z on the screen. And you can fix that with either essential oils, herbs, or homeopathy. So, we're going to focus in what time we have today, so speaking mostly about the voltage piece of this puzzle. The primary things that control voltage in the cells are thyroid hormone and its buddy, the adrenal hormones. Thyroid and adrenaline uh, are uh, like two horses pulling a wagon. If you try to correct somebody's thyroid levels uh, with thyroid alone and they are insufficient in adrenaline, you'll make them feel worse. As you ramp up their metabolism and there's no adrenaline there to support it, they simply crash. So sort of the basic foundation for fixing this almost all chronic disease is you've got to get the thyroid and uh, adrenal levels correct. And by the way, there's a huge uh, problem in correcting thyroid because uh, the labs are 10 years out of date and because you can have a normal TSH and be 80% deficient at the cell membrane by not having enough free T3 because you can't convert T4 to T3. So if we have time, we'll talk about that in some more detail. One of the interesting things is scars. And it should be of particular interest to this group because almost all dental uh, decay begins with a scar in that acupuncture meridian that shuts down the pump that's inside the tooth that allows it to get decay. So scars are quite important uh, but, and must be uh, addressed if you're going to solve the voltage problem. Uh, once you figure out uh, which, uh, that you do have a problem with the scar, and when we have time I'll teach you how to do that, you can uh, simply correct the, the problem of the scar shorting out that circuit in about uh, three minutes and, it's, and it stays fixed in 99 plus percent of people. But of course the most important one for this group are the dental infections. I would say that probably as much as 90% of the people who come to my office who've been sick for something in the neighborhood of 5 to 15 years are sick at least in part because of dental infections that have been overlooked uh, and not corrected. Uh, people get stuck in sympathetic on and parasympathetic off and uh, as I'll show you in a moment that not only uh, makes it impossible for your voltages to be normal but is the primary cause for uh, TMJ, uh, TMJ disease. Um, the, you have to uh, deal with toxins because essentially all the toxins in the body are electron stealers and thus lower the voltage. You have to deal with heavy metals and with emotions. One of the, of the most dramatic things that I uh, do in my office, uh, it continues to amaze me, is we find people who have uh, low voltage in a circuit and then we check and they have an emotion that is a magnetic field blocking that circuit. It takes five minutes to erase that and then uh, patients uh, often have tears in their eyes and their voltage goes up. And if we have time, I'll teach you how to do that as well. Um, and of course, infections uh, uh, cause low voltage. Um, I'll just mention in passing, uh, because of limitations of time, one of the things, as you see, the list that you have to fix for people is reasonably long. And one of the things that's annoying is having to open 10 or 15 different bottles of nutrients every morning. Uh, and so I got uh, personally tired of that and it was a problem with compliance and so I went through the physiology books and wrote down everything I could find that it takes to make cells work. And Then I went to a biochemist and said I want to put all this stuff in one bucket. 
so people can make a milkshake every morning and not have to, do, to open so many bottles. Well, a lot of these things don't play nice and also are fairly unstable, so it took a while for her to do it, but eventually she got it done. And so now we have this thing called Restore, where you simply take a scoop of that, make a milkshake with it in the morning, add a couple of other things that we couldn't put in here, like iodine and, and uh, humic and fulvic, and nitric oxide, and then you're done for the day. So I'll skip past those things for now. But by the way, it has even the stuff you need for people who have trouble methylating. So in the 35 minutes we have less left, let's talk about voltage. Now, one of the confusing things about voltage is that people are generally unaware of the difference between conductive volt, uh, voltage and, or conductive electricity and that uh, in a solution. If you think about the electrons that are in the copper wires that are bringing voltage for these lights and my computer and so forth, uh, that is in a wire and either the switch is on or the switch is off. If it's on, the electrons are flowing. If it's off, they're not. But if you talk about this water, it's a completely different subject. When you have a solution, you have the possibility of it either being an electron donor or an electron stealer. And so in order to figure that out, you use a special voltmeter uh, that measures the voltage of the water. And it will tell you if it's an electron donor or electron stealer. By convention, if it's an electron stealer, we put a plus sign in front of the voltage. If it's an electron donor, we put a minus sign in front of the voltage. And then we convert the voltage measurements to a logarithmic scale that goes from 0 to 14, and we call that pH. So plus 400 millivolts of electron stealer is a synonym of a pH of 0, and minus 400 millivolts of electron donor is a synonym of a pH of 14. And if it's neither an electron donor nor a stealer, we call that a pH of 7. So uh, if you go by a pH meter, and by the way, if you're, if you're doing anything at all with pH, I encourage you to do it with a meter and not the strips because the strips are incredibly unreliable. Um, you, there's a switch on your meter, and you can switch it to, to, to give the readout in millivolts or the readout in uh, the logarithmic scale called pH. And of course, it's much easier to do the one with the voltage. Now, if you have an electron stealer, it causes damage. It's a pH of 0 to 6.9, and we call that acidic. So when you hear people say disease only occurs when the body is acidic, they're telling you that disease only occurs when you're deficient in electrons. We talk about free radicals. A free radical is a molecule that's missing electrons and is trying to steal them from somebody else and usually hurts that somebody else in the process. Most commonly, free radicals are stealing them from cell membranes and damage the cells as they do so. It's the positive pole. It's destructive in the atomic level. It spins left. Electron donors, on the other hand, can do work. It's a pH of 7.1 to 14. We call that alkaline. So when you read, like, uh, eat alkaline foods, alkalize or die, alkaline this, alkaline that, basically it's saying, hey, you need voltage for your cells to work. And then we talk about antioxidants. An antioxidant is simply a molecule that has extra electrons and is happy to give it to anybody who needs them. So when mom says, eat your veggies, they're good for you, she's so saying basically, eat your veggies, there's extra electrons in there that'll go over and, and whip up on the free radicals that you don't want. It's the negative pole, it's constructive, and at the atomic level, it spins right. Now, when you look at this slide, you might ask the question, didn't anyone ever teach you not to put so many numbers on one slide? Well, I did it on purpose, and the reason that I did it is I often hand this out because it gives you the ability to see a lot of different things. First of all, the colors that you see on here are the colors that are uh, on a pH strip. And secondly, um, it gives you the ability to uh, make some comparisons. Now, if you uh, go out and buy a cellular biology book, it will tell you that cells are designed to run of a pH of 7.35 to 7.45. And so if you look at the conversion scale, you'll see that 7.35 is a synonym of minus 20 millivolts. And minus is electron what? Donor. 
So it says uh, here that 7.44 is a synonym of minus 25 millivolts. So what your cellular biology books will tell you is that cells are designed to, to run in an environment of minus 20 to minus 25 millivolts. Now sometimes people get confused because they read that cells uh, run at minus 90 millivolts. If you take a cell and put it in a petri dish and put an electrode inside the cell and an electrode outside the cell membrane, you'll read around uh, somewhere around 70 to 90 millivolts across the cell membrane. But in your body, cells are not in a petri dish, are they? And you don't have electrodes inside your cells. So the environment in which the cells are designed to run is minus 20 to minus 25 millivolts, not minus 90. Now, to make a new cell requires minus 50 millivolts. So which has the more horsepower, um, the um, minus 25 or minus 50? Minus 50, even though it's numerically a smaller number because we're talking about electrons, it has twice as much energy. Now, <clears throat> so what's the voltage in my thumb? It's a good thumb, by the way. Minus 25 millivolts, right? Now I hit it with a hammer. Ah. So I just destroyed a bunch of cells in my thumb with that hammer. And so what happens to my thumb is that it automatically goes to minus 50 millivolts. And the reason it goes there is several. One is that it takes that much energy to make the new cells to replace those I just destroyed with a hammer. Secondly, the way we're designed is that minus 50 millivolts causes the arterial capillaries to dilate. And the reason we're designed that way is that you're going to have to have a bunch of raw materials to make new cells, aren't you? And so as those capillaries dilate, they dump all of those raw materials at the curb so you have them available so you can make new cells. Well, when arterial capillaries dilate, you get all of the signs that we normally cause call inflammation. So we get swelling, we get redness, we get increase in temperature, we get a pulsing pain, and it makes you say bad words. So we get busy and we start making new cells and pretty soon we replace all of those we destroyed with a hammer and now the thumb goes back here to minus 20, minus 25 millivolts. It's a nice pink thumb. It works well and we're happy. That's the way things are supposed to work. But consider the scenario in which you smash your thumb but you don't have enough uh, uh, voltage stored in your body to get up to minus 50 millivolts or you get up to minus 50 millivolts, but you run out of voltage before you finish making all the cells that you destroyed. And you get down here. You're somewhere down here below 20, minus 20 millivolts. In this situation, your thumb is pale. It hurts all the time. And there's really nothing that you can do to fix it because you can't make new cells. And so you are now stuck in chronic disease. Again, chronic disease is defined in my paradigm as the inability to make new cells at work. Well, when you're down there, you can do all the surgery you want, you can take all of the pills you want, but you, nothing is going to really work because you can't make new cells. So you're stuck in chronic disease. The only way you can get out of the chronic disease is to insert enough electrons and provide all of the raw materials it takes to make cells so you can get back up here. Once you get back up here, you start making cells and then you heal things. Now, if you were to put in enough electrons to get up to minus 20, minus 25 millivolts, the pain would go away. But once you quit putting in electrons, you would sink back down here because you didn't cure the problem, did you? You only temporarily fixed it by putting some uh, voltage in. You have to put in enough voltage to get up here to minus 50 if you're going to cure it because that's what it takes to make new cells. So if you understand what I just uh, said about the thumb, I would suggest you get up and, and uh, leave because uh, that's all I have to tell you. Um, now really the point is that that's really the, the basis of the entire paradigm. What you have to do to get out of chronic disease is identify, first of all, that you don't have enough voltage to, to make new cells or, and or you don't have enough raw materials to make the cells or you have some toxins that are destroying the cells as fast as you make them and the way you get out of chronic disease is to solve those problems. 
Now, if we go back up here to the chart, we see that as voltage begins to drop, at minus 15 millivolts you get tired, at minus 10 you get sick, and as voltage continues to drop, things go downhill and disease gets worse and worse until you finally get to plus 30 millivolts. Cancer occurs at plus 30 millivolts, and plus is electron what? Steeler. So cancer occurs when you've reversed the polarity. Now, there aren't very many things that will reverse polarity. Uh, certainly radiation will do it, certainly smoking will do it, certainly uh, a lot of petrochemicals will do it, etc. So of the seven cases that I've seen where it was not a dental cause, it was one of these other things. But almost always the thing that is strong enough to reverse the polarity is a dental infection. And, of course, uh, Dr. Boyd Haley is here. I saw him wandering around uh, earlier, and uh, his work confirms uh, what I've just told you, that some of the most severe toxins known on the planet simply are those that come out of teeth. And so that we have enough toxins out of dental infections that you can reverse the polarity. So that's everything from tired to cancer. Well, that's quite a bit, right? Now. Let's take a look at some of the things that happen as voltage drops. First of all, I mentioned to you that at any given uh, level of atmospheric pressure, the amount of oxygen that will dissolve in water is dictated by the voltage of the water. So if I were to take this water and I put a tube in it and I start bubbling oxygen in here, the amount of oxygen that will dissolve in this water is dictated by the voltage of the water. If I raise the voltage, uh, then more water goes into solution. If I lower the voltage, oxygen comes out of solution and disappears. Uh, so as our voltage drops, the oxygen in our cells drop because cells are 70% water or so. Well, the next thing that happens is the efficiency of metabolism uh, drops. Now inside our cells, we have a rechargeable battery system called ADP ATP that is designed to provide the energy that's necessary for the metabolism inside the cell. Well, if uh, we have a rechargeable, oh, by the way, when the, when the battery is charged up, we call it ATP. When it's discharged, we call it ADP. So obviously, if we have a rechargeable battery system inside the cell, we should have a battery charger in there, right? And we do. It's called the Krebs cycle. Now, the Krebs cycle likes to uh, work with uh, fatty acids. Um, so for every unit of fatty acid that you put into the Krebs cycle, if oxygen is available, you get enough electrons to charge up 36 to 38 of these ATP batteries. However, for every unit of fat you put in there and oxygen is unavailable, you only get enough electrons to charge up two of those batteries. So obviously, your metabolism becomes very inefficient. Um, when uh, oxygen is uh, diminished. And what controls the oxygen level? Our old friend, voltage, right? So as voltage drops, oxygen drops. As oxygen drops, the efficiency of your metabolism drops. Now the other thing is, that happens is that each of us contain about a trillion bugs. Now. These bugs are suppressed and asleep as long as oxygen is available. But as soon as oxygen disappears, the bugs wake up. And when the bugs wake up, the first thing they want to do is have lunch, and they want to have you for lunch. Now, bugs don't have teeth, so they can't take a bite out of your cells. And so instead, they put out digestive enzymes that begin to dissolve your cells so they can get the nutrients out. So the bugs are having a great old time, but how do you feel? Yeah, you're having cells damaged, and so you feel terrible. Think about having strep throat. The strep bacteria are having a picnic on your tonsil. They're having a good old time, but you feel terrible. You got the world's worst sore throat. You, those digestive enzymes get in your blood and go all over the place, so now you have a headache, you're vomiting, you have diarrhea, your muscles ache, and then those digestive enzymes go down and scar your heart valves and scar your knees. And so we have this process then of these bugs having our way with you. Now, uh, these uh, images that you see here are taken with a phase contrast microscope. Now, most physicians in hospitals use bright light microscopes. 
If you take a bright light microscope, you simply take the specimen that you want to look at, whether it's blood or something else, and you often heat it to stick it to the glass. Then you pour chemicals on it to dye it, uh, and then you take a look at it, and usually you're looking at it at about 40x. Well, you miss a lot when you do that. Um, most all of you have been in a closet with the light off, but there's a little peep of light coming in, and you can see the dust in the air, right? And then you flip the light on and you don't see the dust anymore, it disappears. The phase contrast microscope is designed in just that way. It has a little peep of light that goes sideways through the specimen and you can see things that are invisible with a bright light. And what you see, of course, up here in this one, you see uh, all of these cell wall deficient bugs inside this red cell having lunch on the cell, which makes it smaller and smaller and eventually it gets much smaller than that one. Down here you see some more of those cell wall deficient bugs here. There's a little spirochete running through here. Up here in a minute you'll see a uh, neutrophil. Here it is cruising down the boulevard, but it can't see these guys because these uh, bugs in here are, don't have cell membranes anymore. The point I'm making is that as voltage drops and oxygen drops, bacteria shed their cell membranes and become cell wall deficient. There are several reasons that's important. First of all, the immune system uses radar to detect cell membranes, uh, and so a lot of the, of the symptoms and signs of infection are the result of that. So you get a fever, you get an increased white blood count, you get a shift uh, either left or right, et cetera, uh, because of the sensitivity to the seeing the cell membranes. So when bugs drop, the, when the oxygen, voltage and oxygen drop and the, and the bugs shed their cell membranes, none of that happens. So you don't have the signs and symptoms of a, of, uh, a fever. And in addition, you can't culture cell wall deficient organisms with one exception. If you put antibiotics in the culture media, then you can grow them. Wait a minute. We add antibiotics, it makes these things grow better? Yeah. That's a problem, isn't it? So then the lower the voltage goes and the lower the oxygen goes, the more pathogenic these guys become until finally, when you get down to plus 30 millivolts, these guys turn into cell wall deficient fungi, mycelial fungi, and that's when the cancer shows up. It's been uh, shown about every 50 years since 1845 in Paris that cancer is associated with fungus and the, uh, uh, the proof of that goes on and on and on. Well, the point is that you can see these cell wall deficient bugs if you look with a phase contrast or, or, uh, or a dark field microscope, but you can't see them with a standard light microscope. By the way, down here in this, uh, this uh, bottom right corner, uh, this was a girl who was 15 years old with the known diagnosis of Lyme disease. I put a drop of blood on a cover slip and put it on the slide and I was about to look at it and I got called away for something so I just set it aside and kind of forgot about it. Came back about four hours later and I looked at it and you can see all the spirochetes crawling out of the red blood cells that are not there when you first look at it and you can't see them until the oxygen disappears uh, underneath the cover slip and then you'll see these crawling out. Now this is a drop of blood from the guy who used to be my office manager when I was a traditional ophthalmologist. He developed leukemia and you can see all of the fungus in his blood here uh, floating around. And this is uh, Kurt Oberlin, Olbrich, I mean Kurt Olbrich. Uh, he's a German uh, microscope uh, developer who developed this microscope that's capable of seeing 40,000 power whereas a standard microscope can only get up to 1,000. With uh, the uh, strength of this microscope, you can see lots of interesting things. Here you see the digestive process inside a mite. And this is very important for dentists. You see this is what bone looks like in its real living state. And so when you pull a tooth, You've got all of this left behind, and look at the hiding places for microorganisms. This is why you have to use ozone. Only ozone, will, get, uh, since it's a gas, will go bubbling back through all of those nooks and crannies uh, and be able to get rid of the infections. Let me go back here again. 
So I think you can see what happens when you inject ozone in here, it'll get back in there. But notice there were no blood vessels in there. So if you give oral antibiotics, the antibiotics are never going to get down in those nooks and crannies because there's no way to get them there. Well, here you can see yeast, which is uh, not quite to the fungus level, I mean, to, yeah, to the mycelial fungus. And here you see the cell wall deficient mycelial form that's associated with malignancies. And Oldbrook and their group have shown you find these in the blood two years before you can diagnose cancer any other way. Well, one of the things that one can do when oxygen is level, uh, when oxygen is diminished in order to buy yourself some time, because it takes some time to fix thyroid, to, it takes a lot of time to get an appointment with a biological dentist. Uh, that's what takes the most time, right? Um, the, it takes uh, time for the dentist to get the uh, infection out of your mouth. It takes time for you to restore all of the things we've been talking about. And so you can do a lot for people uh, during that time by using hyperbaric oxygen because you force the oxygen in and with hyperbaric, you put uh, excess oxygen not on the red blood cells because they're almost always saturated, but in the plasma. And so since plasma can get places that even red cells can't get, you can get a lot of work done with the hyperbaric. Uh, and uh, so this is the tank we have in our office in order to accommodate that. And uh, it really kickstarts things. Well. I've got 15 minutes left and about two hours worth of things to tell you, so I guess I better talk faster. That's the trouble with being Texan. We talk so slow it takes us longer to say anything. What about acupuncture meridians? Acupuncture, what, it, what an acupuncture meridian really is has been discussed and uh, wondered about and uh, said that it's a figment of somebody's imagination for many years, like 5,000 years. Um, this is Helene Langevin at the uh, medical school in Vermont. Uh, Dr. Langevin and her group uh, published an anatomical record that acupuncture meridians are the association of where uh, fascia touch each other. And this is uh, some of her work. Um, this is Thomas Myers who published this book called Anatomy Train. Uh, uh, Thomas Myers is a uh, massage uh, therapist who has access to cadavers. And instead of using sharp dissection, he used blunt dissection and showed that you can dissect fascia all the way from the foot up to the head and that the pattern of these uh, connected uh, fascia uh, are similar to acupuncture meridians. What Myers did not do is to uh, take them on into the skull and what he also did not do is to define um, a, the majority of the uh, uh, or all of the meridians. He didn't define all of the meridians. And some of the fascial strips that he found are not, do not follow the classical uh, pathways of acupuncture meridians. But I think he was on target, and I used a lot of his work to develop what I'm going to suggest to you in a moment. One of the interesting things about fascia is that fascia is a semiconductor. For those of you who don't know what a semiconductor is, uh, and why would you? Um, a semiconductor is a collection of molecules designed to move electrons at the speed of light, but only in one direction. Fascia is a semiconductor, which helps us understand why when you put a drop of essential oil on your big toe at the speed of light, those frequencies are in your brain. Bang, like that. Well, I've proposed that acupuncture meridians are simply stacks of specific muscles that provide the power for our organs. It turns out that the human body is a portable electronic device. And like all portable electronic devices, it has to have a battery system. And it's been uh, well published and uh, presented that uh, muscles are piezoelectric. So what does that mean? If you take a piece of quartz and squeeze it with a pair of pliers, it emits electrons. And when it emits electrons, uh, that's called piezoelectricity. So whenever I move my muscles, I am generating electrons because my muscles are piezoelectric. In addition, my muscles are rechargeable batteries. 
So one of the reasons that exercise is so incredibly important is that it's the way that we're designed to keep our battery system charged up. I've also already mentioned to you that fascia are semiconductors and that, of course, the stockings of fascia that surround muscles that are actually serving as our body's wiring system. And so what I'm proposing then is that um, each organ has its uh, specific stack of muscles that provide the voltage for every organ system, and they always form a loop. So the loops either start in a foot or a hand, and they go up and then back down uh, and make the loop. And so here's the, what's called the spleen meridian. And what you see is it begins in the foot, goes up the leg, goes up the inside of the leg, goes up the back, and into the neck. So if we look at it in more detail, here you will see the, um, the uh, beginning of the spleen meridian uh, in the foot. And it goes up the leg and goes up the inside of the leg and then over to the genitalia. It goes up to the back and then up into the head. And here are the terminals in which you can tap into that uh, system and measure just like the terminals on your car, on, your, on the battery in your car or the one you have in your cell phone uh, or in your uh, uh, flashlight or whatever. So we can tap into these uh, with uh, the biomodulator, uh, which is, of course, this little gadget that we developed that I'm not going to have much time to talk about, but if you have the ability to simply put it on there and measure and see what the voltage is in each of your organs. And then um, as we keep going up, you see it comes into the neck. And here then it comes over and connects to the part that's going to go back south. And by the way, this is where the uh, stomach circuit provides voltage for the macula of the eye. So anybody who has macular degeneration will always have low voltage in the stomach meridian. And here the stomach meridian uh, of good, of particular importance is that the stomach meridian provides voltage to the frontal lobes of the brain. Then it goes around the eye, around the mouth, uh, around the jaw, uh, down through the neck. And then here you can see it goes to the pectoralis major. Uh, so far I've never seen a breast cancer that didn't have low voltage in this circuit and that's, you can see obviously why that is because the uh, stomach meridian is the power supply for the breast. Well, it goes down the rectus abdominis, uh, down the front of the leg and makes the circuit to the bottom and down to the big toe. So, and then of course, as I mentioned, if you have a scar that goes across and engages the fascia, you create a short. And so uh, the way you know if a scar is shorting out a meridian is simple. You simply do muscle testing, however you like to do it, whether you use the arm, the O-ring, uh, whatever you like to do for muscle testing. And you test the person and you see they're strong and then they take the index finger and middle finger touch the scar, muscle test them again, and they'll go weak. Because when they touch the shorter of the ground, it, weak, it shorts out, the, weakens the whole body. And that's the way you quickly know that it's shorted out that meridian. And uh, since I won't have time to do it uh, this morning, perhaps when I speak to you again this afternoon, I'll show you how that shorts out or why that shorts out the pump that's inside teeth that pump from inside the tooth into the mouth to prevent the decay. And when the, it's primarily the scars that take down the pump, they will allow you to get dental decay. Well, uh, if you have a scar across it, then it creates this short. And, uh, and uh, perhaps this afternoon, I'll be able to show you how to fix that. But here again, you can see this is various types of scars. And common ones, of course, there are a lot of uh, women who have breast surgery, which shorts out the, the stomach circuit. Um, and then here's the same one in the knee, and then here's a common scar, a uh, cesarean section scar, um, which also takes out the uh, stomach meridian. And then, of course, uh, because each one of these power packs goes through specific teeth, when you have a dental infection in that particular circuit, that is the worst thing about taking down that circuit because a dental infection is strong enough to act like a circuit breaker. When you come home uh, from work and you go into your kitchen and the refrigerator won't work and the lights in the kitchen are dim and you go into the living room and the lamp in there won't work and you go into the 
bedroom and uh, the switch back there won't work, it's you automatically say, oh, the circuit breaker must have blown, don't you? You go out in the garage, you find the appropriate circuit breaker and turn it back on and everything works. Well, that's the same way with the body. When you have a dental infection, it turn, takes down the whole circuit. And um, so uh, the, when the circuit is down, then you have all of these various symptoms in all different organs that are on that same power supply. Emotions are stored in the body as uh, magnetic fields, and these magnetic fields act in a similar way as a scar does in that it often will take down that uh, thing as well. And again, you can identify the emotion uh, uh, using muscle testing and quickly get to the time of it and then get to what it is. And if a person can remember that emotion, we can erase it in five minutes using the frequencies in the biomodulator. And it's quite dramatic how people respond when you erase those emotions and get that voltage working again. Well, I mentioned that we can use the biomodulator to measure uh, on these various terminals. We have terminals uh, on the main cables in the body where we can tap in. And as you might guess, it's amazingly powerful to know what the voltage is in every organ in the body. And once you identify the organs that have low voltage, then you can simply go figure out why it's low, and then you begin to correct it. Well, um, I'm basically out of time for this morning, but I wanted to, uh, I hope that uh, you, some of you or most of you will be able to come this afternoon because I want to talk to you about the, uh, the way that uh, when we are in sympathetic on, it causes the entire body to twist out of shape which includes the skull, and when the skull is out of shape, guess what happens? You get TMJ and you get the bite problems. So that whole scenario that uh, d dentists are interested in about what causes uh, t uh, TMJ joint disease and what causes uh, problems with unstable bite, I'll show you why that happens and how to fix it. Uh, you can fix it in two minutes. So. Um, let me finish uh, in the few uh, minutes that I have to get back. Uh, by the way, I have to tell you that a root canal is no different than any other uh, avascular necrosis. Uh, it's an iatrogenic avascular necrosis similar to a diabetic foot. And so uh, I think I want you to call your attention to the fact that the dentists are the only physicians that believe you can get away with leaving dead tissue in the body. I can't find any other physician who believes that. And I certainly don't. Because all day long I see people come in who've been sick and it's simply, it, the sickness began shortly after they received a root canal and it's gotten worse and worse and worse. And when they go get that removed, the voltages come back up and they start getting well. Well, I want to end my time here by telling you about the, uh, this case. Um, in the beginning of this conversation, we talked about um, this patient that had all these various symptoms of things that didn't work. That patient was me. So, um, as I mentioned to you, I began to have mental confusion. I began to have uh, pain in my, uh, in my upper left abdomen, I began to have severe GERD, began to have pain, it felt like somebody was sticking a uh, knife in my um, left big toe, so I went to see my neurologist friend who said I had idiopathic neuropathy. And of course all of you know what the word idiopathic means, it's a synonym for I don't have a clue. Um, so um, you'll recall then that here's why I had pain in my left big toe, because I had low voltage. And as I told you earlier, low voltage is what causes pain. Pain is simply a symptom of abnormal voltage. Uh, so I had pain in that toe. Uh, lots of uh, problems with, uh, with urination, et cetera, with pain in this uh, pelvic area with um, a spleen that swelled up and hurt all the time 
And then, of course, the thing that made me quit working was the mental confusion that uh, occurred because my brain should have been running at 25 millivolts, and when I got the equipment to measure it, it was running at between 2 and 4 millivolts, so that's why it didn't work. And uh, I developed a scar in my left macula because the macula is on the same circuit, and it was, of course, right. I had a root canal in number 14, and, of course, the poisons, the, bio, the uh, bioethers and gliotoxins coming out of that number 14 simply went up and caused an epiretinal membrane, which puckered up the macula and caused a scar and uh, diminished vision in that eye. And, by the way, I've never seen, since I figured this out, I've never seen an epiretinal membrane that wasn't caused by a dental infection in the molar underneath that eye. Uh, the, um, so all of the, of the symptoms that I had that I told you about, including my bleeding disorder, were caused simply by a root canal number 14. My platelet count was running 30,000, normal 150 and above. 48 hours after that root canal was pulled, my platelet count went back to normal. Uh, so, what I've hoped to accomplish this morning in this hour was to give you a different paradigm about how the body really works. That um, when patients have chronic disease, it's because they've lost the ability to make new cells that work. And you have to go through the checklist uh, high on the list of what always is present when people have chronic disease is low voltage. And you go through the checklist of what can cause it to be low. Most commonly, it's due to uh, a combination of hypothyroidism and a dental infection. And then uh, you have to be sure to fix the nutritional piece, which starts with fixing uh, stomach acid, etc. And then uh, I wanted to help you understand that uh, that uh, everything in the universe that works uses energy to do so and we're no exception. And that because we're a portable electronic device, we have a battery system uh, that are rechargeable muscles. And once you begin to think in that term, uh, then it, when a physician begins to think more like an electrician and less like a pill pusher, then you can figure out what's going on. And uh, by working with a biological dentist, you can uh, cause most people who are ill to become well. Well, thank you for the time. I'll look forward to seeing you again this afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Tennant. Before we break, um, 